Hi, so in a previous video we built this thing, which is a Stirling engine. And I thought I'd go through how a Stirling engine actually works, because sometimes it's interesting to know, so you can change things and make it better. Now what I've got here is a balloon. And that balloon has a certain volume of air in it at a certain temperature. And because it's at a certain temperature, it has a fixed volume. Now, if I take this balloon and pop it into a bucket of cold water, which I've got here, then that air will get colder. And as it gets colder, then the volume will decrease. And there we go, with the colder air, the vol volume's got smaller. Now, if I put that into some hot water, then the heat of the water will make that air expand and the volume will increase. And it happens quite quickly. So there we go, we've got it expanding. Pop it back into the cold water and you can actually feel the balloon getting smaller and bigger as you put it in and out of the hot and cold water. Now if we can capture that somehow, we can make a stirring engine. So the big question with Stirling engines really is how to take that contraction and expansion of air caused by heat and capture it somehow to do work. Now if I take an empty stainless steel canister and stretch a rubber membrane over it, which in this case is just a cut down piece of balloon, fix that with an airtight seal or a piece of rubber band, then I create that. Now heat that, and as the air expands, you'll see that rubber creating a dome on the top, and that will continue to go out, depending on how much heat I put in there and how much that expands. Now, as I let that cool, that will make the rubber go back down flat. If I cool it down below the ambient temperature where I captured the air, that rubber will create a U. So here's a bucket of cold water. We pop that in there and that will cool the air quite quickly and you can see that rubber has flattened off. Now that movement of the rubber is created by the pressure difference of the heating and cooling of the air. You heat it, the volume increases. If you've restricted the volume then you'll get an increase in pressure and vice versa as you cool it and the volume decreases, you're restricting the volume so you get a decrease in pressure and you can see it dipped in now and that is the basis of this machine. Now I talked about it as being a fixed volume leading an increase in pressure because it's not strictly that. Actually what's happening is that the air molecules in there are zipping around at a certain speed and hitting the sides with a certain force. If I put energy into it, then I increase the speed of those particles, so they hit it with that much more force. And as they hit it with that much more force, we perceive that as an increase in pressure. That increase in pressure is what causes the doming. Equally, if I cool it to take energy out, then effectively I slow the air molecules down, so they don't hit it with quite as much force. And because they don't hit it with as much force, you don't get it doming out. In fact, because I started with this with fixed pressure when I sealed it, and now I cool it down below the air pressure, that is the energy that the air molecules have, the air molecules are also hitting this thing. They hit this thing harder than the air molecules inside are hitting it, so we get it going down in its U-shape. So it's the addition of energy by heat, or the taking away of that energy by cooling, that leads to a difference in the speed of the air molecules in there, which we measure as pressure. Now, if I didn't have the volume fixed, of course, that increase in pressure would lead to the increase in volume. So it's actually that way around. And if decrease in pressure would lead to a decrease in volume, because we're decreasing the energy that those air molecules have. When I fix the volume by using this rigid side, then we see it quite easily. It's all concentrated in this area and it's really, really easy to see and therefore really, really easy to use. So if we have a bit of a better look at what's actually going on, because of course the machine wasn't an empty can, there was something else in there. If we take our empty canister with its membrane and we heat it, then the air will uniformly expand because of the increase in pressure. And that can be a problem. So what we did with it is we put in it something called a displacer. Now as the displacer is in the top position like this, 
all of the air is in this position, and because we're applying heat at the bottom only, the air expands. But the air expands so that the membrane takes on that dome shape. Now, if we then move the displacer down, then the displacer will take all of that hot air and shift it into this region here. That region there is colder than this region here. So once the air gets into this cold region, then the whole thing starts to shrink, and that membrane goes back down to its flat position. So we're getting this work done through the two positions of the membrane. Now, that's for that Stirling engine. Stirling engines use this change in pressure, change in volume, in lots of lots of different ways. I've used a rubber membrane, but you don't have to. What you can do is attach it to a piston. And as that air volume changes, that piston will go up and down because of the change in volume. Now, in order to do that, you need to move the displacer up and down. So, when the displacer is in the lower position, and we're applying heat here, remember, then the air is cooled, reduction in pressure, this piston will come down. When we move the displacer up into its higher position, then that cold air is forced around the edges of the displacer. That's why the displacer doesn't have to be a perfect fit. You need that air to be able to rush around it. And as that air is moved down into the hot region, it's heated and we get expansion and that piston will go up again. And that movement of the piston is related to the change in the volume of the air or the change in the air pressure caused by the displacer moving up and down and effectively shuttling the air between the hot and the cold region. Just like when we had the balloon, we moved it from the hot water to the cold water. This is a mechanical way of shuffling that air around. So we can see that using this. What I've got here is a canister and the displacer this time has a rod in it so I can actually move that displacer up and down. And in that tube we've got some coloured water. It's just there. That coloured water in the tube is acting like a piston. It's actually called a liquid piston. Now, when I put this on the heat source, the air is going to increase in pressure or expand and we'll see that liquid move up and down. And there it goes, moving up the tube like that because the air is increasing. Now if I pull that displacer up, it puts more air into that hot region and so we get a bigger movement. As I push it down, then the air moves into the cold region and you can see that it moved up to there. At the moment it's moving up that way because it's in the hot region. When I push it into the cold region it will move that way. And there it goes. So that change in pressure is causing that liquid to move like a piston. Now, when we look at a standard Stirling engine using the piston movement, then obviously there has to be a difference between where the displacer is and where the air is getting heated and cooled. And it's 90 degrees out, we call it 90 degree phase displacement. That is, when the piston, when the displacer moves down, the air is forced into here and is cooled. That cooling means that piston will then move down. It moves down after this one has moved down, and that's the way it has to be. This one has to move first, so that the air gets into this region. It cools, that leads to the pressure decrease, which moves that piston. Once that piston's moved, we want to move the displacer back up. This time, all the air is forced into the hot region, heats up, expands, and that then moves that piston back up. So that phase displacement is really, really important. Now, if you do this where you have the piston and the displacer linked to each other with a crank, then that crank needs a little bend in it 90 degrees out. And that's why it's a 90 degree bend on this kind of Stirling engine. Where this piston, which is called the power piston, is 90 degrees off this piston, which is the displacer piston, because of the movement of the heat and the cooling of the air. That is, it has to move first, then cool. It has to move first, then heat. Now, ours doesn't use this arrangement. Ours uses that diaphragm arrangement. So something slightly different is going on. So they're not linked in that way, in the way that a standard Stirling engine is. And there's good reasons for that. Any machine that's got linkages is more likely to wear out. Having the membrane separate from the displacer means there's less to wear out. And so it's going to work for an awful lot longer, just because there aren't that many mechanical parts all linked up together. 
But the question is, how is it working? Because it still uses the displacer. If you look at the video, you'll see I made this tin can with a rubber balloon on top of it and wound that round with wire wool. Now, our can looks like this, and our displacer is in the centre of it, like that, with its wire wool here and here. Then we put a loop on there, and that loop was attached here, and there's a very important little hole in the, in the side of the displacer. Now, the reason that little hole is in the side of the displacer is because some energy is lost. As this heats up, then that diaphragm, the piece of rubber, is going to want to go up, and we saw that in the little demonstration that we did. But that pressure increase also means that the air is forced through that little hole to increase the pressure in the centre of that uh, displacer chamber. As that pressure increases, then equally, that goes up. That going up forces the displacer down, which forces the air from the hot region into the cold region, then it all cools down. When it cools down, that is going to want to flatten out, but this pressure difference is reversed, so the air now comes back out, this lowers this one, and the displacer rises. Now, it needs a 90 degree angle. That 90 degree angle is taken care of by the fact that that is made very small. If you made a very big hole, it wouldn't work. A small hole means that there's a difference because it takes time to force its way in there between the lowering and raising of the displacer and the lowering and raising of the balloon membrane. That is really key to it working. Now there's another section that's key to its work, and you can remember we put a weight on here. Putting that weight on there means that that displacer and that membrane has to do more work to raise itself. Now, if it needs to do too much work, then that will go into there far too quickly and the air won't get hot enough too little and that won't go into there, that will raise itself far and very readily. So that weight that we put on there is critical to the tuning of this particular device. You have to play around with the weight, and that's why it's critical to that device. Now, there is one other really interesting thing that we did. We put steel wool around it, and there's a good reason we put steel wool around it. That steel wool is actually called a regenerator. And that regenerator has a certain function. Now, as that air is hot and is forced up past the regenerator into the cold region, this wire wool gets hot. Now, when we swap it round and the cold is, air is pushed through here, that wire wool actually retains the heat and preheats the air before it gets into this section here. So that regenerator acts as a heat or cold store to help the air heat or cool before it gets into the hot or cold region. And that increases the efficiency of the thing very, very much. Um, very markedly. So basically that's how that machine actually works and how all Stirling engines work. Now I thought that would be of interest so I thought I'd do a quick video on explaining it and hopefully you found it was interesting and thank you very much for watching.